Our scripture reading is Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. We will read the first 20 verses of Galatians 4. The connection to the sermon is particularly the first few verses of first seven verses or so that indicate the work of God, the triune God in our salvation. Galatians 4. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Albeit then, When ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of Him, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years, I am afraid of you, that is to say, I'm afraid for you, is what he means, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preach the gospel unto you at the first, And my temptation which was in my flesh ye despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy, because I tell you the truth? They zealously affect you but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that ye might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. We end our, stop our scripture reading there at verse 20. The basis of this and many other passages of the Word of God is found the instruction of the Heidelberg Catechism in Lord's Day 8. Lord's Day 8. And referring back then to the Apostles' Creed and the previous Lord's Day, in question 24, the Catechism asks, how are these articles divided? And the answer, into three parts. The first is of God the Father and our creation. The second, of God the Son and our redemption. The third, of God the Holy Ghost, and our sanctification. Since there is but one only divine essence, why speakest thou of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Because God hath so revealed himself in his word, that these three distinct persons are 
the one only true and eternal God. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord's Day we consider this morning is really an introduction to the confession of the Apostles' Creed, which we will be treating. It starts with a confession, I believe, or to put it differently, I have faith, I have faith. That's quite a thing. The Catechism in the last Lord's Day explained the tremendous importance of faith. It is a wonder work of God that grafts us into Jesus Christ. Graft into Him with a true and living bond, though you can't see the bond, though you can't touch it. It's a real bond, a spiritual bond that connects you to Jesus Christ. We are grafted into Him. And united to Him, we draw from Him our life and every blessing that He has earned for us. It all comes through faith. The Catechism also described the twofold experience of the power of faith as it operates in our lives. A certain knowledge, that is, a knowledge with absolute certainty of everything that God has revealed in His Word, that it is true. And that it is true not merely in the sense that, well, yes, everything there is true, but it's true for me. It's a truth that we can be so absolutely confident about because it is the truth we have experienced in our own lives, in our own souls. Based on that knowledge, we have confidence. A hearty confidence. A confidence that because we are God's people, we can go to Him. We may go to Him. We go to Him in prayer. We come to Him in worship. And as we come to Him, we can be confident He will receive us. And He will deal with us as His own children. Faith gives us that confidence that we can go to God. All that and more is implied in the words, I believe. There's more to faith. Faith seals to us our salvation. We are saved by faith. This was the confession of the Ethiopian eunuch as Philip explained to him the Old Testament Scriptures. And then Philip said, do you believe? And he said, I believe. This was the confession of Martha at the grave of her brother Lazarus. I believe. This is what Philip, the Philippian jailer, responded how, how Paul responded to him, rather, when the Philippian jailer said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, Believe. Believe. You must believe. That's the way of salvation. We are saved by faith. A living faith. It's just an, an amazing thing. It's such a wonderful thing that God determines to save us that way. Even though it's all His work of salvation. He makes us to be conscious. He makes us to be living. He makes us to be active in that. So that by faith we take hold of Christ. And we say, this is my Savior. We take hold of forgiveness of sins and say, I am forgiven in the blood of Jesus Christ. Faith is that important. We're quick to add, I believe in God. This is not a general belief in the goodness of man. There are many people who say, have faith, have faith. And what they mean by that is have faith in man. Faith that man will be able to overcome the many difficulties that he faces in life. Faith that ungodly men will invent new inventions that will take care of the troubles and the suffering of life. Faith even that somehow we will be able to escape death and hell. It's not that. It's not a faith in the general belief that good will triumph in the end. This is a faith in God. Why do you believe? 
when so many people do not believe in God, the answer is God has given you faith. You have faith. Without faith, we are all born in unbelief and in rebellion. And we would seek throughout the every moment of our life till from the time we're born to the time we die to satisfy ourselves and to fill up the lusts of the flesh and we would perish eternally in our misery. But we have faith. And this morning we look at what this means to have faith in God. We take as the theme for the sermon then faith in the triune covenant God. Notice in the first place, one, the one true God. Secondly, the living God. And thirdly, the covenant God. Faith in the one, rather in the triune covenant God. The one true God, the living God, the covenant God. Very simply stated, our confession this morning is our God is God. He is God. And that means, first of all, that He is. He is. He exists. This very basic part of our confession is something that is denied throughout the world. It's denied even by those who call themselves biblical theologians who study the Scriptures. They deny that God is. They deny that God is by denying that Jesus is God. By denying that the Holy Spirit is God. Constructing an image, they say this is what God is, but it has nothing to do with what God has shown of Himself in the Holy Scriptures. Man every single day denies that there is a God. They deny that there is a God by refusing to acknowledge Him. Just think of the very simple act. Every single day, sitting down and eating meal after meal after meal, and never once praying and acknowledging that God is the one who has given me this food. They are denying that God is. They deny it by their life. They deny that there is a God who must be worshipped and must be obeyed. As they, for example, today will desecrate the Lord's Day and call it my day to do as I please on my day off instead of saying this is the Lord's Day. They're denying that there is a God they deny that there is a God by their sinful, ungrateful seeking of all of the corruptions of this world. Their life testifies there is no God to be feared. But our faith says God is. He is. Our faith takes hold of the revelation that God gives because you can't know God, and you cannot confess God except God reveals Himself to you. He reveals Himself, first of all, in the creation around us. The Belgian Confession says this is like a most elegant book. Everywhere you look in the creation, there is God revealing something of Himself. He reveals Himself in the powerful storm as Reverend Langrack explained, explained so well out of the book of Job. God is revealing Himself there in that storm. He is revealing Himself in the beautiful, exquisite beauty of a flower opening up to reveal the beauty there of the Creator. He is revealing Himself in every part of the creation. It all testifies. God is. God has revealed Himself more clearly and fully in the Word, in the Bible, the written Word. In the face of Jesus Christ, God testifies, this is who God is. This is how you will know Me. This is how you will serve Me. The Bible is His perfect and infallible 
revelation. Without hesitation, therefore, seeing God's revelation in the world around us by faith, beholding His revelation in the Scriptures by faith, we say, God is. God is. And then we say, God is God. We confess His sovereignty. We confess that He is almighty. Again, this is, again, this is denied by so many, even by those who are biblical theologians. When they give to man the ability to accept or reject the offer of salvation, they're denying the sovereignty of God and making man to be sovereign in the matter of salvation. If they think that our calling is to subdue the world because Christ is not in control of it, so we have to control the world and subdue it for Christ, denying that Jesus Christ is now ruling over all things. They are denying that God is God and that He is sovereign. When a man is a law unto himself, when he does as he pleases with his money, his family, his life, he is denying God is God. He is denying the sovereignty of God. Anyone that complains about their path of life the troubles, the hardships, and the sorrows, and says, I don't deserve to have this kind of thing, denies that God is God and is sovereign over His life. But by faith, we know God is God. He is sovereign. We sang it today. Psalm 115, verse 3. But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever He hath pleased. He is sovereign. We know that not only from the Holy Scriptures, which is the clearest revelation, but we know it from our own experience. That God rules. That His will is done in this life. There are many times in this life when we do not understand why things are going the way they are. God is ruling over the thoughts and the intentions of men and decisions are made and certain things go the way they do. And we wonder why is it going this way? And then years later perhaps we can look back and look at it and say, now I understand. God was in control. He had a purpose in this happening. So also in the things that seem to us to be just totally evil. Surgeries and cancers and, and paralysis. And so many other things that happen in our life. And we wonder why. But we know God rules. He is sovereign over all that happens. And it's something we learn that this sovereign God is working all things for our good. And that even the evil which comes upon us, He turns to our profit. We learn that from experience. We believe it by faith. We know that God is. We know that God is God. We know that He is the only true God. Man has his idols. He will turn deliberately away from God, Romans 1 says. He will turn deliberately away from God to worshiping idols. In the jungle they will worship the animals or the trees. Through the desert they go with their images carved out of stone that they carry with them. The Orient... In the Orient, they bring their food to their idols and offer their incense and food to their ancestors. Man has many different gods. Modern man, who laughs at the need for God, yet bows before the God of material things. Bows before the God of drugs, or lust, or power. Or technology. Man is a servant. 
He was created a servant. He will worship and serve something. Modern man may say there is a God out there somewhere. But there are many gods. They will do a comparative religion study and come, trying to come to some understanding what might be the God if we look at all these religions and take them together. What might be the God men serve? Let each one of us have his own idea of what God is. There is a God, all right. You may have your idea, and I may have ours. Theologically, that comes into expression with the the encouragement, go to the church of your own choice. Whatever God you want to serve, go ahead, serve Him. But that's wrong. There's only one God. The God who has revealed Himself through Jesus Christ in the creation, the God who reveals Himself especially in the Holy Scriptures, that's the only true God and living God. That's what Israel said. Surrounded by nations that had a myriad of images and priests and temples, Israel said, there is only one God. It's Jehovah. And all the idols that you serve are vanity. They are not God's. That's what our God is. The God who has revealed Himself in the Bible. There is none other. I do not mean to say that we take the attitude, I am always right. Or, my church is always right. We must always be willing to learn from Scripture. And if someone would come and say, you have a wrong idea about God... If he can show that from the Bible, I'm listening. I want to listen. I want to hear. I do not want to have a wrong conception of God. If you can show me from the Bible that my conception of God is wrong, I want to hear about it. That's our attitude. But at the same time, we do not simply say, well, it doesn't really matter. What ideas you have about God, just be somewhat reformed. We must not be afraid to say, you have the wrong conception of God. God is holy. He does not tolerate sin. God is everywhere present. He is Absolutely sovereign. He sent His Son to die for the elect and for them alone. That's who God is. You see, you change any of those theological positions and you affect who God is. That's why the doctrines that we hold to are so important. Because they involve God Himself. Who He is as He has revealed Himself in His works as well as in His being. Either you believe in that God or you do not. You must be sure in your own mind of, on the basis of Scripture of who this God is and you must confess that God as He has revealed Himself in the Holy Scripture. That's what we are saying this morning. We must not be ashamed of that. We must not be embarrassed. We do not hide behind the, the old saying, oh, well, that, well, that's your interpretation of the Bible and I have my interpretation. No. The Bible is clear. It's not a matter of interpretation. The Bible is clear on who God is. And that's the God. You must confess. I believe in God, the only God, as He revealed Himself in Jesus Christ. And that God is triune. He's triune. 
after a long, long struggle of some 80 years, the church finally came down to a certain formula of explaining God. A certain formula, I mean, they, they found terms that they could use to try to capture, to explain who and what God is. And this is what the church came to. He is one in essence, but three in persons. It took them 80 years because God is really beyond us. I do not say that we capture God by that. But at least we are theologically correct, biblically correct, when we say God is one God, He's one in essence, and yet there is within that one essence three persons. The idea of a person is not easy to grasp. It's not a word taken from the Bible. A person is what makes you to be what you are. Unique among all other persons. The impress of your person is on every part of your being. The impress of your person. It's upon you physically so that within your cells, whatever cell you take out of your body, it's different from any cell taken out of my body or anyone else's in this audience. It has a code which belongs to you and you alone. It determines your hair color, the shape of your feet, face, the size of your feet. It determines how you look. It determines even the print on your thumb different from every person in the whole wide world. Your person is pressed upon you physically. The whole of your body belongs to you as an individual person. Your body will not fit with any other soul that ever was or is or will be. Also, your soul is has the impress of your person. The general characteristics. You may be bold and outgoing. You may be reserved and more shy. But that's part of your person that makes your soul act, live the way it does. It determines much of what you like or dislike and your outlook on life. You are unique. Your person makes you different from everyone else. Now try to take that, that idea of being a unique individual person, and put that within the Godhead. There are three distinct persons in the Holy Trinity. God is three in person. When we say that, we are not merely saying that God is a personal God. That is true too. God is a personal God. He is not an impersonal force like the wind or the waves. There's no personhood in the wind or the waves. Those are impersonal forces. God is not an impersonal force. He is a personal God. He is able to love. He is able to speak. He is able to respond to us. He knows, He loves, He is a personal God. But within that one God are three di distinct individuals. Three persons, each of which has a unique personal character and personal characteristics that make each one of the persons different from the other two persons in the Holy Trinity. Briefly, 
we look at these three persons. The Heidelberg Catechism speaks of a Father, a Son, and the Holy Spirit. The first person the Scripture identifies as Father. He is first, not in time, not in importance. Please get that straight. He is first, but not in time and not in importance. He is first as far as His place within the Trinity and His work, His function within the Trinity. He is first in the sense of source within the Trinity. If you see a river and you follow that river back to its origins, you finally come to the fountain out of which that river comes. The fountain is first as far as the river is concerned. It's not more important than the river. It's not first in time even, but it's simply the source out of which the river flows. The first person of the Trinity is the source within the Trinity, if we can try to grasp that. He has been given the name Father, therefore, to indicate that as well. A father has offspring, and the Bible has informed us that what makes the first person different from the other two persons is he begets a son. He begets a son. That is his personal characteristics. This must be an eternal activity of the first person. If it is not an eternal characteristic that he begets the son, then there was a time when he was not a father. That's impossible. He was eternally the Father. And that means eternally He begat the Son. That's why I say, not in time that He's first. There was never a moment when the Father was not begetting the Son. This is beyond our comprehension. We think of children being born. A child that didn't exist before is conceived in the womb and born. That's how we think of birth. But within the Trinity, you have to erase that. And you have to say, God the Father eternally begat the Son. That is His place within the Trinity. He's the source. He's the Father of the Son. He is a person. He loves he loves the Son. He loves us. He sent His Son to die. He is angry with the wicked every day. He's a person. He has those emotions. He has those activities. The Father is a person. The second person of the Trinity, the Bible calls the Son. He is second not in importance, nor in time. There never was a time when the Son did not exist, if I may put it that way. In eternity, He always existed. That's why we speak of the Father eternally begetting the Son. That which makes the Son di distinct from the Father is that He is the begotten One. The Father is the One that is unbegotten, the Son is the one who is begotten. But that is an eternal reality. There never was a moment when suddenly the Father begat the Son which wasn't there before. The Son eternally was in the Trinity as Son, begotten of the Father. That's His place in the Godhead. That's His function within the Godhead. Because he has the name Son, he must have a Father. That's what identifies him as being distinct. That's his personal characteristic, begotten of the Father. As a person, he loves the Father. 
As a person, He reflects the glory of the Father. As a person, He loves us. He came into this world taking upon Himself human flesh to suffer and die. As a person, He was obedient to His Father. He reveals the Father. He glorifies Him. He is a distinct individual person. The third person in the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. He is third, not in importance. He is third, not in time. Eternally He existed. He is as important, as powerful, as glorious as the Father and the Son. He is not third in importance. But His place, His function within the Trinity says He's third. As you look at the Father's source, you think it's obvious that's first. The Son is begotten. The second person, you think, that's obvious. That's the second. The third person of the Trinity is the breath or the spirit or the wind. That's what the word means. Breath. As breath, He proceeds from the Father, the source, to the Son. And then He proceeds from the Son back to the Father. Within the life of the Trinity, He is third, not in importance, not in time, but simply because of the function of proceeding from the Father to the Son and from the Son back to the Father. He is the Holy Spirit. He is a person. The Bible says the Spirit searches the deep things of God. The Bible says that the Spirit teaches us. He's a person. He leads us in the truth. He sanctifies us. The Spirit is a real, active, thinking, individual person within the Trinity. And yet not three gods but one God. One in essence. The very being of God is one. Everything that makes God to be what He is. Those are His attributes. God is love. God is spirit. God is light. God is goodness and righteousness and holiness and truth. He is omnipresent. He is all wise. He is all powerful. All those things belong to all three persons equally. You did not cut God up into three parts. You did not divvy up the attributes of God. They are all those things equally within the Godhead. They all think the same divine thoughts. And yet, here's the beauty of it. The Father thinks them as a Father thinks them. And the Son thinks them as a Son thinks them from His viewpoint. And the Spirit from His viewpoint. And yet, one thought. They all make the same plans. But the Father makes a plan from His point of view. And the Son makes the plan from His point of view. And the Spirit makes the plan from His point of view. And yet, one plan. They speak the same word, but as a Father, as a Son, as a Spirit. One God. This is the testimony of Scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Hear, O Israel, more literally, Jehovah, our God is one Jehovah, not three. And yet, in the very first chapter of the Bible, God begins to reveal Himself as being more than one within Himself. As in Genesis 1, verse 26, we read, And God said, Let us make man in our Image. Clearly that can't be the angels then. He's not talking to the angels. He's talking within Himself. Let us 
Make man in our image, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And after our likeness. And in that same verse, after speaking within Himself in the our and the us, we read, God made man in the image of God, made He, singular, one, made He man. After just talking within Himself, about what they will do together. Then we read, and He, God, unitedly made man. Triune, three, but one. That's our confession. God is. God is sovereign. God is the only God, and He's triune. One essence, three in person. And that means He's the living God. He's the living God. God has life within Himself, different from all the other gods that men invent. They are singular gods who might have fellowship with other, other gods, but never within themselves. If you believe in an Allah, if you believe in a Buddha, and you say, that's my God, that's a God without a life. That's a God who existed eternally without anyone to talk to, without anything to do. There's no life there. Our God has life. Because He is three in person. Each person eternally was active according to His personality within the Holy Trinity. The Father eternally was begetting the Son. The Son eternally was begotten of the Father and reflecting the glory of the Father. The Spirit was eternally proceeding from the Father to the Son and from the Son back to the Father. There was eternal life. And now that's not a mechanical thing, as if it just went on and on and on and on that way. But this is a life. A life of joy. A life of fellowship. A life of love where the Father is begetting the Son in His Infinite love for His Son. And the Son is eternally be revealing the glories of the Father out of love for the Father. And the Spirit is proceeding from the Father to the Son out of love. And back to the Father out of love. There is joy. There's fellowship. The best friend you ever had in this life, the most beautiful family life you ever experienced, cannot compare to the beauty and the glory of the life God has within Himself. You understand, He doesn't need us to be happy. He didn't become happier when He created people. He wasn't lonely. He's eternally the living God. And that pattern, that activity... Is always the way God works then. It's always of the Father and through the Son and by the power, the instrumentality of the Spirit that God performs everything. We know that, that because that's the way God revealed Himself in His Word. Again, the Heidelberg Catechism sets forth different works and seems almost to divide the Trinity into three different parts or three different activities for the Father, one some for the Father, some for the Son, and some for the Holy Spirit. It speaks of God the Father in our creation, the second of God the Son in our redemption, and the third of God the Holy Spirit in our sanctification. And that's because they're on the foreground in those works. But the whole triune God was involved in all those works. For example, when we speak of the creation, clearly, it's a triune work. The Father speaks. But what does He speak? He speaks a word. The word is Jesus Christ according to John chapter 1. The word speaks. And yet in Psalm 33 it says that by the host of them that God spoke the word and by the host of them He formed them by the breath of His mouth. Because Genesis 1 speaks of the Holy Spirit right there brooding over the face of the waters as a mother bird brooding over her egg. Same word. The Holy Spirit is giving life to this creation. Of the Father speaking the word 
through the Word, Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, everything came into existence. The creation is a triune work. So is redemption. The Father loved us and chose us in Jesus Christ and determined to give His Son. And we read that here in Galatians, how that in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son. Jesus didn't come on His own. This isn't His work by Himself. The Father sent Him into the world to accomplish the work of redemption. The Son went not because He was forced to do this, but because He loves us. And because He receives the elect from the Father and enters into our flesh. And in John 10, He says again and again, And I lay down My life for My sheep. But the Spirit is involved. The Spirit loves us. And the Spirit is the one who formed the Holy Seed within the womb of the Virgin Mary. He is the one that anointed Jesus. Remember the dove. You children remember the dove coming down on Jesus when He was baptized. Well, that's because the Spirit came on Jesus to equip Him to do the miracles, to do the teaching, and finally to hang there on the cross and experience the wrath of God, the Spirit gave Jesus that power. The Father sent, the Son came and performed the work by the power of the Holy Spirit. A triune work is our redemption. So is sanctification. The Father determined to sanctify a people to Himself He lifted up Jesus out of the grave and set Him at His own right hand and then gave to Jesus the third person of the Trinity that became Jesus' own Spirit so that Jesus could pour out the Spirit. The Spirit of life. The Spirit who sanctifies. And the Spirit does the work as the Spirit of Christ. He is the agent. He performs the work. He gives us forgiveness. He gives us justification and peace and sanctification. Everything that God does is triune. Of the Father as source, it originates within the first. Through His Son, by the instrumentality, the power of the Holy Spirit. Every work. It doesn't matter what it is, creation, redemption, sanctification, whatever. God works in a triune way. He's the living God. And therefore, He is the covenant God. He has a covenant within Himself. And when you think about that, You think, what kind of a life is that? Well, obviously, it's not a business agreement that they make agreements among each other. They are so intimately in love with each other and so intimately connected. They don't make business agreements. It's not a conditional covenant where the Father says, well, the Son, if you do this, then I'll do this. And the Spirit says, if you do that, then I'll do this. That's not the kind of covenant that God has with Himself. It's a covenant of friendship. It's a covenant of love where they delight in each other, where they seek each other's company, where they seek each other's good always in that covenant relationship. And this is such a perfect, perfect covenant life exactly because of the nature of the covenant. Because of the nature of the Trinity, I mean. Because of the nature of the Trinity. Friendship requires essentially two things. Two people who will be friends, first of all, have to have something in common with each other. Otherwise, there cannot be a friendship. Things in common, viewpoints and experiences and joys that they have in common. Secondly, there has to be a diversity. 
the two persons cannot be carbon copies of each other. There must be a difference between each other, a difference in viewpoint, so that you can discuss things together and enjoy fellowship. God has a perfect covenant life. There are distinctions within God, three persons, each with his own viewpoint, each with his own distinct personality. Every one of them, all the three, different from the other two. There is a difference, a distinction within God. And yet, what unity. Perfect unity. Because they are one essence. Never a disagreement. Always harmony. In unity. In the Trinity. There is no sin. There is no disagreement. They have a perfect covenant life together in the Trinity. But the astounding thing is that God determined to reveal Himself to us by showing us His covenant life. And then in the nature again, in the beautiful plan of God, not merely to tell us about that life, but to bring us into that life and make us to experience something of that life. With that goal, He planned the whole work of salvation. A mediator who would go between God and us. He planned election, the atonement, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in order that we might be able to enjoy covenant life with God. This is His plan. Therefore, in the fullness of time, He sent forth His Son to pay for our sins that we might receive the adoption of children. And those who have received the adoption of children because you are His sons, He sent His Spirit into your heart to confirm the fact that you are His child of God, to give you a strength of faith that you can know that you belong to Him. And that you out of your own heart would cry out to Him, Father, call God your own Father. This is what God has done and is doing. And He leads you with perfect care through your life here on this earth. He takes you through trials and dark ways of temptations and sin and all the time leading you back to Him by His infinite mercy, by His astounding grace, in order one day to take you to live with Him in heaven. To live with Him. To enjoy covenant fellowship through Christ who is our mediator and experience something of the beautiful covenant life that God has within Himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What a day. Now we see Him, as the Bible says, through a glass darkly by faith, but then face to face. Now we know in part by faith, but then face to face. We will know the one only true God, the triune God. We will know Him. What a thing. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank Thee for Thy revelation of Thyself. For the glorious, perfect revelation of Thyself in Jesus Christ through whom we know Thee as our Father, knowing also Thy Son and Thy Spirit. Continue, Lord, to work in us that we experience the Trinity in our daily life by faith. And therefore, confess this from our experience. Continue, therefore, to write Thy Word upon our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.